So before we start, once again, let's just have a short word of prayer. Lord, once again, we thank you so much for what you have given us this day. And Lord, I just ask through the Holy Spirit and through our Lord Jesus Christ that you use this servant, that the words I shall speak shall not be based on my own understanding, but shall be spoken for the Holy Spirit, that God has a message for each one of us today. May, Lord, the hearts today be changed. May the ears be opened. May the mind be cleared. And we thank you for what you did, as Elizabeth said, the way you gave your life for us, so that we may have life. We pray in the name of Jesus, our living Savior. Amen. What a beautiful day. An absolutely wonderful day. Good morning and welcome. So today will be part two, what is called God's call to genuine repentance. Now, for those of you that might have watched online, that you weren't here, and we also welcome back, Caroline. Welcome back. I'm glad you're feeling so much better. Last week, we spoke about some of the things that happened to us, how sin can so easily take control of our lives. Not just that, how even when we repent, how sin has an unusual way of continually coming back. Not just some sin, a lot of times the same sin. So what I want to just, a quick reminder of last week, one of the main points is that God answered our prayers and gave us conditions for not just forgiveness, but what is called genuine forgiveness. I gave an example last week of getting your hand caught in the cookie jar. You get caught, you cry, you beg for forgiveness, but you still got the cookie in your hand and you still got the cookie in your mouth. So when the punishment is over, what do you do? You go to your room and you finish the cookie. So were you really sorry? If you were really sorry, you would have spat the cookie out and thrown the cookie away. Or, we know it's hard, you shouldn't have gone into the cookie jar. But that's what sin does in our lives. But as I say, God gave us four answers. Number one, humble yourself by admitting your sins. That's a hard part, admitting our sin. Number two, pray to God asking for forgiveness. Not just saying it, saying, oh. No, we have to truly ask for forgiveness. Number three, seek God continually. Number four, as I said last week, this is the hard one. What do we do with our sin? Do we just kind of put it aside? Or what does it tell us to do? Turn from our sin. We have got to turn and walk away from our sin. And not just our sin, but our sinful behavior. I had a very good discussion this morning about this. And something very interesting came into my mind. Sin is not just sin. Sin can sometimes become a habit. We start doing something, and we don't realize. We know originally it's a sin, but we are human, right? Do we, are we weak? We fall off in sin, right? This happens. It happens once. It's a sin. We ask for forgiveness. But then it happens again, and then it happens again. I've had more than one question about why is it I keep on doing the same sin over and over again? Because it becomes a habit. You're just so used to it. You turn around like any example. We do something that will change the way we think. We're so stressed out and we've got to have a relief. So we find an easy way out, that easy relief that makes us feel good for a couple of hours. Ah, it's so much better. You don't think about it anymore. But what happens? The world comes back. The reality comes back. And then the next time you feel depressed or down or hardshipped, what do you do? You do it again. You know it's a sin. And that's what I'm saying. After a while, it's no longer a sin. It's a habit. And you no longer think of it as being bad, 
but an easy escape. And that's how Satan works in our lives. He, he, he clips away a little bit at a time in our life. Like, for example, me. I start off with Stephen, and eventually I end up with Steve because the real part of me is being chipped away. I've accepted what I've got into, and it feels good temporarily, right? But you don't understand. It's just, no. Think of who we're sinning against. We're sinning against a holy God. And we realize, can anyone here tell me that it is hard, or sorry, that it is easy to get rid of sin? Is it easy or is it hard? I've got a hard here. It is hard, isn't it? Now, my question to you is, have you tried to get rid of the sin? Have you really tried? That's a symbolism, yes. But it's through. But as I say, have you really tried to get rid of that sin? In order to get rid of sin properly, what we also need to do is we need instruction. And where do we get instruction? Right here, the Word of God. So what I want us to do right now, because what we have to do, we, know, we not only are trying to get rid of sin, but we need to be like Jesus and defeat sin. Amen? How do we get genuine, not just surface repentance like the cookie jar, how do we get genuine repentance? I want you to go in your Bibles in the New Testament to 2 Corinthians. Once again, write this down, or if you're fast at flipping through the Bible, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So once again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Hmm. That's interesting, right? But sometimes, what does that mean? This is uh, to you mothers as well. When you give birth to a baby, it is a new what? A new what? A new life. That's right. Something happened. It's a whole complete change, right? You go from having this baby inside of you, all the pains, and, and then all of a sudden, as soon as that baby is born, it's a complete change. It's a new baby. And this is what this verse means. When you accept Christ, you start a brand new life. Right? You become a Christian. But you have to understand, in order to do this properly, like genuine repentance, you have to have a faith in Jesus Christ. Not just a faith saying, oh, I have faith that I'm going to win the lottery next week. No, that's artificial. We have to have a true faith in Jesus Christ, who he is. In the spirit of genuine repentance. You remember what we said last week? Genuine repentance is a deep sorrow for what you have done against God. So yes, you have to trust in our Savior. That means that you have to turn from your old life to your new life. That's right, a new beginning. And that is what the Christian life is all about. It's a new start. It's a new beginning. Now, if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. So when you start looking at the Scriptures, and no matter where you turn in the Scriptures, the Old or the New Testament, everywhere you turn, something new happens. In the same way, when a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, once again, through genuine repentance, just remember what repentance truly means, that you have a sorrow for the life that you have lived, and you should be committed to what? A different kind of life, correct? As was mentioned to me last week, we need to change. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, oh, I'm going to clean up my life now, because you know what? You can't clean up your life. Salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you say, you know, I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, 
and you truly, truly mean it, then the Spirit of God at that moment does what? Can anyone tell me what happens at that very time that you accept Jesus Christ? What does the Holy Spirit do? He wakes up, right? He becomes alive in you. He becomes your essence. Your spirit at that time is renewed, right? Something brand new. Now, what we got to remember, the Holy Spirit is living within you to enable you to live out the life that you have just received. Remember, salvation is the life we receive. It isn't some kind of gift that God gives apart from himself. We have to understand that. It is the life that he comes to live within us. Therefore, and I'm going to, I want you to pay attention to this, okay, please. It is inconsistent for me to claim that I am a Christian, yet I am living my old life. Doesn't that make sense? We say we're a Christian, we've got this new life, but we keep on falling back to what we used to do. Isn't that confusing? It makes you wonder if, the, if your ex actual repentance is true, if your acceptance of Jesus Christ is real. How can I do these kind of sins when I have actually accepted God to live within me? I want to give you a quick reminder in, from Luke about the prodigal son. We remember the prodigal son, right? He wanted his inheritance from his father. He left. We don't, had a great time, didn't he? Didn't he have a good time? Didn't last long, did it? What my point is here is, what did he do when he was wallowing in with the pigs to clean up? At that point, he wanted to do what? He wanted to go home, right? He wanted to go back to the father. So at that point, he made a decision. He said, I know that I'm not worthy to go back home and be accepted as his son. So I'll go back and I'll be one of the slaves. Wow, what a decision, right? This is a decision that we make in our lives. So as I say, he went in faith that his father would accept him back. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to see the father. I've got to go clean up, right? I'm going to go take a bath, get rid of the smell of the pigs, put on nice clothes, get a haircut, shave. No, he didn't do any of that. Why? Even though he wanted to look good for his father, no, he went just as he was. He got up. Can you imagine what he looked like and what he smelt like? I don't know. I've never really played around in a pig pen, so I'm not sure. Are there any farmers here? I'm sure there's some farmers watching online as well. But can you imagine the smell? How dirty he looked? It's in his hair, it's in his skin, it's on his clothes. But even with this, he still, he headed on down the road. He went towards his father. And you know, like I said, he must have looked horrible. But here's something important. When his father saw him, does anyone know what his father did? You're right, he hugged him, but he did more than that. Okay, this is a great example of what God did. And it's actually one of the only places in the Bible it mentions that the father, he ran to his son. Yes, he hugged him, but he kissed him. Regardless of how he looked and how he smelt, the father was so rejoiced at his son coming back that he hugged him and he kissed him. We know what happened after that, the feast and everything like that, and how the brother was jealous. And this is a great example of the Father in heaven. Regardless of what we have done, if we have a true desire to come back to the Father, he's there waiting for us. He will run to us and he will welcome us home. Isn't that amazing? Wow, I love that. Wow. Now, Here's another part. What was he also doing, the son was doing, when he actually went to his father? He was saying how sorry he was, correct? He was trying to confess and repent to his father. What he didn't realize is the decision that he made back in the pig pen was what counted the most. 
He wanted a change right then and there. And at that point, the father forgave him. So this example, and if you want to read more about this, this is in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. I encourage you to read it from start to finish. It will help you understand a lot more. And this is the same thing in our life. He wanted to spend his inheritance and go live an easy life. Does that describe our life? How we want to take the shortcut? And then we wonder how sin keeps on repeating in our lives? So this is a perfect example of not just repentance, but genuine repentance and genuine forgiveness. We need this in our lives. Now, the main meaning of this parable is that God desires to bring those who are lost, sinners, into a relationship with him. And you know what? When he welcomes them home, he rejoices with a heartfelt godly happiness over our heartfelt godly sorrow. Now, many of you might not understand what a parable is. A parable is a moral or a spiritual story. With, it has such a meaning. I'm sure many times you've heard about what a parable, you've heard parable this, parable that, but it's the meaning behind it. Now, what I want you to think about just for a minute, think about when you were younger. I keep on going back to when we were younger, right? How many here could truly understand why you even got in trouble in the first place? Can anybody say when they were young they understood what sin was? Not really, right? Think about that being a kid then to being a kid today. People are living all kinds of wickedness in their life, right? And they think nothing of it. But here's their solution. You said, you know what? Yeah, I know I've lived a really bad life, and I know how to fix it. I'm going to go to church. So you know what? You go to this church, then you go to that church, and you try so many different denominations. That's a fix, isn't it? You're going to go somewhere where it's good, and you know, you're going to listen to these messages and stuff like that. But you know what? Are you really just trying to die to go to church, or, tr or are you trying to die to go to hell? This is a hard choice we have. I've heard before so many say, you know what, we've got to think about this. I've been baptized as a kid. You know what, I taught Sunday school. Nothing for the ladies, but I sing in a choir. You know what, I've even preached a few times. Well, I'm sorry to say, that will not necessarily do you any good. But you say, hey, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that I am willing to get up and preach and teach and help people to understand the truth that I won't go to heaven? That's not absolutely what I'm saying. You've got to listen to this next verse to understand what I'm saying. So I want you to go a few chapters before back to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And we've heard Pastor Terry preach this one a few times. But it's powerful. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? and in your name perform many miracles, then I will tell you them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. A man can preach the gospel all his life, but here's the catch. If he's never been saved by the grace of God, you know what? When he dies, he's not going to heaven, right? I want you to understand this, please. Listen to this. Salvation has nothing to do with good works. But I always do good for people. I try to help everybody. You know what? You can't clean up your own life. Repentance is not cleaning up our past. 
Repentance is acknowledging our past and accepting the sin that we did against God. Does that make sense? <coughs> now, just before I get on to the next step, I want us to understand false Christianity. What? False Christianity? Yes. There are many situations in our lives where we can be misunderstood or we misunderstand what we are getting into. How many know or they've said, well, I'm a Christian because I was baptized as a child. So I'm a Christian. Have we heard that before? Yes, right? Or we are, here's another great one. We're watching the television, right? You know, the TV evangelists. And they say, now's a great time to repent. Repeat after me. And you know what you do? You repeat after them. You say all the words. But the thing is, what are you doing? You're just saying the words, right? Is not repentance from the heart? So what happens if you're actually just repeating the words? What does it mean? You're just saying the words, right? Does it not say that we must do this with a genuine heart and confess with our tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord? So there are many, many misconceptions about who really is a Christian. And like I said, to start with, there are many people that go to church all their lives. Well, you know what? My father went to church. My grandfather went to church. I've gone to church all my life. But here is the thing about it. Acknowledging my helplessness and turning to him, you have to ask Jesus for his mercy. And you have to learn to place your trust in him. Have we all done that properly? Have we placed our trust in Jesus Christ? And this I'm talking to as well, those of you online. It is a very, very difficult and a hard decision sometimes. We think we've truly accepted Jesus Christ because we said the words, or we do good works. This world is full of mo so many deceits, right? We are tricked into false beliefs. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. So why is there so many, how many religions are there in this world? Thousands, right? And they all, in many ways, teach different things. There are churches that teach you, like I was having a conversation with Pastor Terry, we were talking about the Nicene Creed. And it says in there, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Does baptism forgive your sins? No, right? But there are churches that teach that. So is it the people's fault that go to the church they're being taught, right? So they believe that, oh, baptism forgives. So they miss an important step. They do not go to the one main source. What's the greatest verse in the whole Bible that means everything? The basis of Christianity. John? That's right. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have do you know how many people in this world, how many billions of people have never even really looked at that verse? What about John 14, 6? I am the truth and the life. No one shall come to the Father unless through Jesus Christ, through me. Not me, but Jesus Christ. Many people have never heard these verses. This is what we talk about in in when it's false Christianity, they believe, they are told that they have salvation. But can we afford to take that chance? Can we afford to spend the rest of our life thinking that we have Christianity? What if you don't? What if you're not sure? Have you ever thought about this? Like I said at the start, the questions that have come up about, why does my sin keep on coming back? Number one, temptation. We give in to temptation. Number two, and I'm not saying it as an insult, but have we truly accepted Jesus Christ? 
If we don't have the Son in here, if we don't have him in our heart, what do we have? We are still living according to this world, right? Isn't it scary? Like I said, we cannot clean up our own life. If we could clean up our own life, do we need Jesus? Do we need the cross? Because then we're taking claim for it ourselves, right? No. We have to start really thinking, do we have salvation? We, as a human being, are desperately lost from God. Apart from grace and mercy and the work of the Holy Spirit, this will bring us to a realization we need to be saved. That's right. It's not saying, oh, it's nice, I'll think about it, you know, I'll put it on my to-do list. Right? How many of you have a to-do list? And we never get around to it. That's right. By faith in Jesus Christ, with a repentant spirit, when you come to him with that spirit, your sins will be forgiven. That's right. They will be forgiven. Do we believe that? And at that particular time, when we accept Jesus Christ, your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. So what happened? Your eternity changed. That's right. Your eternity changed because salvation is not just a change here. Salvation is an eternal change. Not just an eternal change, it is also an eternal change of your destiny. When we die, how many locations are there? How many locations can you go to when you die? Two. That's right. Heaven and hell, right? Wow. Only two choices. And here's another thing. In some of the religions and churches, do they not teach, well, you know, we just lost our loved one. They've lost part of our family. So what do they teach you? It's okay. You can pray for them. Have we heard about that? I had a discussion about that this morning. So when someone dies, can you pray for them and God's going to change his mind? What? I'm confused. But some of the churches tell you that when you pray for your loved one, God's going to change his mind. That must be a... F oh, no. I've been wrong all these years. Brothers and sisters, this is taught in many places. It is called the prayer of redemption. Many of you know this one, right? They teach that no matter what, you pray and get, God's going to say, oh, you've got many people praying for you. You didn't accept my son when you were alive, but I don't, because they love you so much, I'm going to change my mind and you can come to heaven. Is that going to happen? There's also a belief that when they're there, when God also changes his mind, redemptive prayer, that those people now, they're going to talk to God about you and you're going to be saved. Isn't that confusing? There's so many things that we, we're told to believe. What I can say is, when we look to the source, the true information, it's all in here, right? We've got to be careful that we don't get the wrong teaching, that what I say up here, or anyone that says up here, is false. That's why we follow along with the Bible and know that what is here is the true and accurate Word of God. Now, I'm going to point this to anyone right now that is not sure about the future, that is really not sure about their salvation. This is a perfect time to change your eternal future, especially if you've not done so and if you're not sure. This is a scary one, isn't it? When we sit here and we doubt if we truly have salvation. So for anyone that is watching right now or listening, for the person who is not a Christian, if you're going to be saved and you want to be saved, here is what you have to do. And I want you to listen carefully. In many ways, this is what's called an altar call or a call to you if you want to change your destiny. 
if you want to change the rest of your life, if you are sick and tired of being a slave to sin, if you are sick and tired of the life that you're living, the first thing is you must be willing to acknowledge your sinfulness to God. What that means is you come to God and you say, Lord, I am truly sorry. I really am. I know what I've done in my life. And please, I am so sorry. This is called a genuine, heartfelt repentance, correct? It comes from the heart. Especially over the fact that you have sinned against your heavenly Father. So therefore you are asking for forgiveness. There are many people who have gone all their lives and never asked for forgiveness. Many people have actually said, you don't know what I've done. How can God forgive someone like me? Many know my past. Many know what I've done. A sin is a sin, no matter which way you look at it. Whether you've done things like I've done, like try to kill someone, rob a bank, hurt people, stolen from people, deceived people. I've been in shoot-ups in ammunition warehouses with a SWAT team. I've had policemen chasing me and shooting at me. I've done so many gang activities. At one point, I even went to church, and I was a drug dealer. I, was, I didn't know. I went to a church where they didn't teach me Jesus Christ. They didn't teach me that doing these things is wrong. I wasn't told about sin. Is that my own ignorance? I can say yes and no. We get to a point in life where we have to truly say, I've had enough. Have you ever reached that point in life where you say, enough is enough? I'm tired of living to sin. I'm tired of living this way. And I want to change. That is a simple but hard thing of asking for forgiveness. Now, here comes the next part. When you ask for forgiveness, you have to do something. And for many that have been raised with a hard life, for many that have been abused, and I'm sure many of us can agree that we've been abused. I was sexually abused, I was physically abused, I was mentally abused. So we have to do one thing that is going to be so hard. We have to trust. How can I trust when every time we turn around, someone's stabbing me in the back? How many have had a difficult time with trust? It affects each one of us, right? But at this point, you have to trust Jesus. That's right. You have to trust what is said in here is true to the word. It is God-breathed. That God gave us this instrument for a reason. That he gave us Jesus Christ for a reason. We have to trust that the reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross was for you, Elizabeth, for you, Ara, Mia, David, Caroline, Arland. He died for each one of us, correct? And we have to trust that this is so true. He died for us so that we could have life. So therefore, learn to trust the one, Jesus Christ. How? By saying, forgive me, please, Lord, of what I have done. I am truly sorry. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At this time, you are opening your heart and you are accepting him, the Lord, the creator of all things, into your heart. And at that point, your life has changed. Like I said earlier, the newborn baby is a brand new life. It's a change. And that's what happens in us when we accept Jesus Christ. If you have not done so, Please, now's the time. If you're not sure if you've truly accepted Jesus Christ and you have doubt in your mind, you're not sure in your heart, I invite you now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this applies to those of you watching online. I could stand up here, any preacher can stand up here, and we can talk and talk and talk about the Word of God. But this word of God means nothing unless you have the one that wrote it. 
the one who it's all about. The Old Testament is the law of God, but it talks all the way through about the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. The New Testament is about the love of God, that, that all of the scriptures and the prophecies were fulfilled through Jesus Christ. I know that we're coming up to Easter, right? We do not celebrate his death, right? It's so sad that he died, an innocent man who was 100% God and 100% man, and the way he suffered is sad that he died, right? What we do is we celebrate his resurrection. We celebrate the fact that he did this for each one of us here in this church and all of you online, for every single person in this world. Any of you watching, you have to understand, Jesus Christ died for those in the past, for those now, and for everyone in the future. And don't say, he won't accept me, because I, there's no way he will forgive us. Did I not say last week that Jesus will forgive all sins, right? Not some, but all. So please, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, now is a great time to change your eternity. We're not saying that life is going to immediately change and it's going to become a bed of roses. No, but this is a short-term thing here on earth for a long-term gain. You can spend eternity in hell or you can spend eternity in heaven. And you know what? God doesn't force you. He doesn't say you have to. He loves us so much that he gives us a choice. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus gives us a choice. So is your choice going to be choosing him or continuing to question, why do I keep on sinning? And if you still, as a Christian, are suffering and having problems with sin, you have to have discipline and you have to want to change. And if you're still having a difficult time, there are people to ask. Pastor Terry is available to be reached at any time. You can ask any one of us, leaders. We, all Christians, are here to help you. If you're struggling, that's the one thing we have to understand. When we accept Christ, we all become one fam family, correct? So therefore, if we're one family, when one is happy, we're all happy. When one is sad, we're all sad. When one is crying, we all cry. But when one is suffering, we all come to help. Let us not look at Christianity as being alone, but being together. Remember, this is only a building, right? It's a gymnasium. But when we're here, it is Christ's church. It is God's place. But the true church, brothers and sisters, is in here. Let us not corrupt this church by allowing sin to keep on sneaking in. If you are still struggling, ask for help. It's got nothing to do with pride, right? Pride has done so many wrong things. But asking for help amongst your family is the greatest thing we can do. So if you, were, if you just accepted Jesus Christ online, let us know so we can help you, so that we can put, point you in the right direction to find a church, a home for you. So if you've done that, wow. Praise be to God. I didn't do anything. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that did everything for us. So thank you once again for allowing me. I hope this has helped us over the past couple of weeks to understand about true repentance, about true forgiveness, and about true salvation. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. And just remember, at Britannia Baptist, our motto is go and go for God. And may we go out into this world and help those who are in need, and may they look at us and see Jesus Christ in our face. We thank you so much. Once again, we pray for Pastor Terry and East Free Baptist Church this afternoon. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is our living Savior. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a blessed day.